Today, we are going to continue our lectures on the American Revolution, and we're going to look at some specific questions today. What I want to look at today are what was the successful, successful strategy of the American Revolution? You know, the real question of any revolution, any war, when we get it down to its sort of bare bones, is why does one side win and the other lose? And what did winning mean, right? And the way you win or lose any contest has a great deal to do with strategy, right? The strategy you employ. And before I get into the specifics, uh, I want to do a little discussion of terms, just some ideas. And what the first thing I want to draw a distinction between is this idea of strategy versus tactics. You know, again, in any sort of um, military history analysis or general historical analysis or even an analysis of any sort of contest, athletic or otherwise, you will often see the use of the word strategies and tactics. And sometimes they're used interchangeably, but academically speaking, they actually have, and policy speaking, I should say as well, they have very specific meanings and applications. And they kind of exist in a relationship. And so I'm, I'm going to talk about them just a little bit here. So the first thing I want to say is tactics. Like, what is a tactic? Well, you know, a tactic usually refers to um, you know, all the short-term, battlefield-focused plans and maneuvers and orders that help you win a specific battlefield or get short-term gains, right? That's a tactic. Uh, they are part of a good strategy. They are certainly helpful towards you being successful. But being tactically brilliant is rarely enough to win the grand contest, to win a war, right, to win a political campaign, to win a World Series. You know, tactics are part of the story, but they're the more short-term focused on the field, battlefield maneuvers, uh, and th that's what tactics are. Conversely, strategy is the big plan, the broadest view you could have of the contest, looking way into the future and looking beyond the actual arena of the contest or a specific battle, but across all different elements. You know, in a war, you look at everything, the social, the political, the economic, the industrial components that you might have to put into some sort of plan or action to help you win. Uh, you know, I, as I was preparing this lecture, I was trying to think of some analogies that would show the difference. And uh, one, with baseball on everyone's mind right now, I would say we could say, you know, going to a lefty reliever late in the game is a tactic. And if you win the game, right, and it, and it works out well, you know, it was a successful tactic. But a strategy would be developing a farm system that uh, explores and exploits the talent in little known reacher, reaches of Latin America that develops a pitching system uh, that produces players that help you win multiple World Series over the course of several years. That's strategy, right? And I should say there's, there's sort of a, in history, certainly, and, and even in general estimation, we have a tendency sometimes to celebrate tactical brilliance while eschewing or ignoring or not giving full credence to strategic brilliance. You know, often, uh, and in the case of the American Revolution and the Civil War and a lot of military history, the tactically brilliant generals are often the most celebrated. And, and this makes sense, right? Because um, their quick thinking and daring on the battlefield, you know, the, the, these sort of dashing plans that win, you know, great battles sometimes, you know, with a smaller force against a larger force. That's often uh, the case of great tactics. And if you were to ask people to list off, you know, the most impressive generals of all time, they'll often list all the great tactical generals. And yet, it's really the strategic thinkers, the guys who dedicate themselves to this sort of grand macro vision, understand exactly what they're fighting against, and have a very often slow, plotting, but precise and sustained effort towards winning the wars that are really the truly most successful generals. You know, one of my favorite comparisons in, in, in American history that sort of highlight this is General Lee, you know, versus General Grant, right? 
Lee is the brilliant tactical general. When defending Virginia, he wins against superior forces numerous times, right, fighting against the Union. But he's a terrible strategic general. He truly is. His only fact foray into strategy is the greatest disaster for the South. It's Gettysburg, right? As it decides to invade the North. He's not a strategic thinker. Grant, on the other hand, is not necessarily tactically brilliant at all, but he understood the real essence of the Civil War. It was started over slave settlement of the West and controlling the Mississippi, bottling in the South was what was at key. That's why the Second Battle of Vicksburg, July 5th, 1863, is the real turning point of the Civil War, more so than, you know, July 4th of 1863, the Battle of Gettysburg, because we get control of the Mississippi, and from there, it begins, you know, the invasion of the Deep South, where you break the will of the resistance under Sherman. I mean, that's Grant. And he's not the celebrated general. He's not the dashing figure. And yet, when we analyze success and failure, the why the Union wins. It's the strategic plans. It's the grand vision. It's not the dashing or exciting one, but seeing the larger picture beyond these wars of maneuver, outside of the battle of maneuver, where tactics matter the most. In a war of maneuver, tactics may be the most important thing to winning a war. But you know, in civil wars, in wars of revolution, wars of attrition, any war really, but especially in those wars, a sort of larger view strategy that understands the political, economic, and social landscape, as well as the battlefield landscape, that's where you're going to find your victories. That's where you're going to find the brilliance and the efforts that yield the positive results. They help you understand why one side triumphs and why the other fails. And, <clears throat> you know, at the beginning of the American Revolution, most of the tactical advantages, in fact, most of the tactical victories throughout the entire revolution rested with the British, right? The British troops, again and again and again, win most of the battles. They conquer and occupy most of the territory at one time or another. They have all the larger military tactical advantages, which we spoke about in the previous lecture. And yet, they fail until the very end to create a comprehensive strategy that recognized the facts on the ground, that really understood what was at stake and what winning and losing really meant in the colonies. On the other hand, Washington, the Continental Army, the Patriot uh, militias, right? They did understand the grand strategy. They won few tactical, they had very few tactical successes. They had enough, and there are some. But on the whole, they did have a better understanding of what was at stake. They knew as in any colonial rebellion, right, any civil war, the battle for the hearts and minds of the people in between was where the battle would really be won and lost. And they do, in fact, craft and pursue a strategy that makes those goals a reality by 1781, two years before the Treaty of Paris, really. After the Battle of Yorktown, they'd won the revolution. And so what we want to do today in this lecture is take a look at exactly what that strategy was, how it worked, how it operated in the grand scheme of the, of the American Revolution, you know, why they won. And on the other hand, we're going to take a look at the, what were the strategies of the British, not only how they failed, but how they actually played into the greater American rebel strategy. And in the end, I'm going to just draw a few conclusions about the American Revolutions and a, and a few things I would like us to think about. The first thing we want to do is I want to talk about what is the successful American strategy? What are they pursuing? I do want to put that out there. And what I would like to say is this, is that you know, Washington, because he's fighting the home front war, as are the Continental Congress, the people there, they had that, that home front view. They knew what was at stake. And they knew from the very, very beginning that the real war was for that, here's that phrase again, the hearts and minds of the general population. You know, they start the war as a minority effort only a third of the population. Most of the population are not patriots or rebels in 1776. And that in order to defeat the British, really, they had to do a couple of things. They had to make sure that the colonies were just flat out ungovernable. They couldn't be governed. They were just too out of control. 
they had to outgun the British, and not necessarily defeat them in any particular battle. They just had to have more people on their side, armed and ready to resist the British by the end of the war. They had to actually win over another third of the population at least. And, you know, the way that this would be done would, well, we're going to talk about the strategy of how this is actually done. But ultimately, the main things the rebels really needed to do was survive. You know, time and resilience were the two keys to the Patriot success and Patriot strategies. You know, the British, there is a clock running on their efforts. Eventually, the taxpaying citizens at home in England do get tired of the war. They get less and less willing to sustain what is starting to look like a futile effort, in spite of the fact they had all these tactical victories, in spite of the fact that they win and win and win again with only a few minor losses, but the losses end up being large because they can't control this population. So the two military branches or components of patriot resistance are one, the Continental Army, and two, these patriot guerrilla militias, these armed groups of fighting citizens who were outside of the control of the legitimate Continental Army. Okay? They would work in concert with it sometimes, but it's also independent. They're more of that irregular style of warfare, guerrilla warfare. Now, the Continental Army, what is it? Well, the Continental Army is, is formed uh, in the summer of 1775, and it's basically formed out of the uh, 20,000 or so militiamen who had laid siege to Boston, you know, after the battles of Lexington and Concord in April, and uh, they drive the British, which are fought by militiamen from all over New England, they converge, you know, on Boston. You know, the British are actually held to a very small area of Boston, and the surrounding areas are controlled by New England militiamen. And after the Battle of Bunker Hill, the Continental Congress realized we need to strike while the iron's hot. We need to take this military rage, this passion, before it burns out and organize these guys into a more legitimate, disciplined, and professional military force, right? We had to find a way to do this. And I want to say, and I, I, hopefully your textbook has highlighted this for you and, and you've, you've learned it somewhere along the, the way, the old mythology that somehow we beat the British by not being militarily disciplined and shooting at them from behind trees and how silly they were to march in order and wear uniforms. That's like crazy. That's nonsense, okay? That is, we ultimately, as far as the war maneuver is concerned, this conventional army, we ultimately became the equals of that army by the hard work of military discipline and professionalism. And it took a while to get there. And until we really reached that point, you know, 1777, 78, we were no match for the British. But they do get there. And the reason we get there is very early on, the Continental Congress has the foresight to, to, to jump in. And they actually, they get George Washington, they appoint him. And he's, he's a strategic choice, not necessarily a tactical choice. He had military experience. He had a great national reputation from the French and Indian War. But he had other qualities, natural leader, a man who was tall and regal looking. And, and, and people had a lot of respect for him. And he's a Virginian. You know, one of the big worries they had was this revolution from the beginning was starting to look like an all New England affair. And they really wanted to sell it as a, as a national event, right? And so they started sending over leadership from, from the other colonies. And George Washington is the perfect guy. And of course, he gets up there and he appoints some talented young people to also be officers. You know, they have to create this whole officer corps. Over the course of the revolution, they will get help and assistance from European professional military officers who will actually teach them how to train, von Steuben, teach them how to arm, teach them how to quartermaster. Really, it becomes a work in progress. And over the course of the American Revolution, starting initially with this, this band of New England militiamen, we create this, this very, very professionalized, dedicated, reliable military force called the Continental Army. And the Continental Army had a couple of important things it did. This is how they helped strategy. Uh, you know, at, never at any one time does the Continental Army ever number more than 20,000 people, roughly, at, at its largest. Although, over the course of the Revolution, some 250,000 men will ultimately serve 
in one way or another in the Continental Army. But any given day, if you were to look at the numbers, they're really never greater than 20,000 and often a good deal less. The Continental Army from the beginning helped sort of create an illusion and a rallying point of national unity. It gave the rebels something to look to, to say, yeah, that's us. That defines us. This is our professional resistance. We're not some ragtag bunch of radicals. We are a legitimate nation struggling for our independence. And it not only mattered on the home front, do you know where it really mattered was the diplomatic front. One of the most important strategic aspects of the success of the revolution was winning foreign support, particularly that of the French. We would never have won it without a very professionalized army. If all we were were guerrilla warriors and resistors, we might have frustrated the British for a long period of time, but we would not have truly defeated them, taken control of this continent and built the nation we have. The presence and the professionalism, the sort of identifiable, um, legitimate unit of resistance, the Continental Army, gave us a lot of weight and bargaining power uh, and made us inviting to the French in particular and the Dutch and other allies as well. And, and the French alliance, you know, by 1778 is, is, is really the essence of, of, of American success militarily. So that's another very important part of the Continental Army. And the Continental Army doesn't win often against the British, but when it does, almost all of its victories are of immense strategic uh, importance. They were important psychological victories. They boost up morale nationally. Uh, the battles of, of Princeton and, 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 and Trenton and the battles uh, of Saratoga are what really bring us uh, into good favor with the French and, and other international powers who want to support us. So the Continental Army does win some, you know, they win tactical battles with huge strategic importance. And so when you count up the victories on either side, it doesn't really tell you the story, even tactically. But strategically, the Continental Army was fundamental for that. And I just want to be clear. I want to reiterate this point, because a lot of this lecture will talk about the activities, uh, maybe even the uncomfortable activities, of the Patriot militia guerrillas and their importance during the war. But make no mistake. I mean, at least half of our strategic success, if not more, was due to the efforts, the successes, the strategies, the dedications, and the sacrifice of the Continental Army, its soldiers, and its, and its growing, uh, ever-learning officer corps. So they really are and deserve to be very much at the center of the story. And they're not being cut out. But they're just part of the strategy. You really can't understand how we win over the rest of that population, the real essence of winning this revolution without understanding the role of the Patriot militias. Now, what is a militia? What are these guerrilla militias? Well, as we talked about in the lecture of the community of violent men, you know, militias were a pretty standard organization throughout the colonies, right? They were volunteer organiza organizations of, of, of citizens, of men, uh, who whenever there was a threat, or violence or some law and order issue that needed to be attended to, they would organize uh, and act with very direct violent purposes to address it. And in the years uh, immediately before the revolution, these militias had taken on an even more political aspect. They'd become even more organized, more militant, right? Uh, especially after 1765. Especially, this is especially true in New England. And, you know, the, all the early battles, if, uh, Lexington, Concord, uh, Bunker Hill, and Breed Hill, they are fought entirely by militiamen. They are militia armies, somewhat democratic and almost leaderless, right? Because each militia only answered to people who were from their own community that they recognized as leaders. That's what Washington had to come and organize and retrain. Uh, these guys could fight. They just, they lacked discipline, but they, they certainly had fighting spirit. They were certainly skilled with, with arms and weaponry. That is true. As, as a citizen population, we talked about this in, a, in an earlier lecture, the colonists are amazingly skilled at acts of coordinated, uh, deadly violence. But the militias continue to exist well outside of the Continental Army. After the Continental Army is formed, there are still militias everywhere, throughout New England, the Mid-Atlantic, uh, the Chesapeake, and of course, in, in the Deep South. 
that every community, every region had these militias, these volunteer, sort of self-regulating, well-armed organizations dedicated to their local purposes. And I should say, they're not all patriot militias. There are loyalist militias. There are communities, or sometimes within the same community, groups of men would organize and arm themselves to defend England and the loyalist goals versus patriot guerrilla warriors. So they're on both sides. And in fact, the, the, the Civil War component of the colonial war, of, of the American Revolution, is fought between these loyalist militias and the patriot militias. I mean, that really what defines the Civil War component of this. And it actually defines most of the violence of the revolution happens at that level, this sort of kind of dark, visceral, community on community, grassroots violence between these groups of well-armed, semi-organized citizens. The Patriot Militia, right, the rebel militia had a very specific set of uh, functions within the revolution that it pursued over the course uh, of the war. And I'm gonna list them right now. One, they were responsible for law and order in places where the traditional authorities had been removed or had been driven out, right? The war is chaos, right? Sometimes there are loyalists and, and British soldiers there, sometimes there aren't. Well, the malicious function is law and order. Judge, jury, police, right? They are the law and order in these areas. And they took that role seriously. They are, you know, the Continental Army couldn't take on that role. The political leadership of the revolution is focused solely on a national war effort. And so that's basically one of the major roles of these patriot militias and of the loyalist militias as well, depending on where you were. They were responsible for promoting and ensuring patriotic fervor and a commitment to the rebel cause, often among uh, a recalcitrant or disinterested population. You know, in many ways, they become the shock troops of ideology, of violent commitment of the general populace uh, to the goals and the priorities of the patriots, right, of the, re of the rebellion. And they would use violence in order to achieve this commitment often. You know, they were responsible for recruiting and supplying uh, volunteers, volunteers, to the Continental Army and to join the patriot militias as well, right? They also function as a fairly dynamic recruiting effort. In fact, most of the people end up serving time uh, <clears throat> in the Continental Army have done so only after swearing an oath of allegiance to some well-armed patriot militia. And in order to show how uh, aligned they are with their goals, they volunteer for the Continental Army. And, you know, I, I should say many of the people, we talk 250,000 people, end up serving in the Continental Army and even more end up taking part uh, in, in the violent reprisals put forth by these patriot militias after they joined them. And we should understand that many of them, maybe most of them, started out as neutrals, disinterested individuals and citizens, or at best lukewarm patriots, right? And it was the patriot militias that got them involved, that put them into harm's way, armed them, and got them involved in these very focused, deadly, violent acts that ultimately win the revolution. I mean, that's what the Patriot Militia, uh, that's its ultimate contribution, really, to the success of the revolution. And it happens for very specific reasons, right? They don't just roll into town and, and round everyone up. There's, it actually happens mostly in response to uh, poorly conceived British strategies. A couple other things about the Patriot guerrillas. And I just want to say that they, uh, they do sometimes, these, these, these patriot militia armies, they will form into larger armies, and they will uh, actually once in a while engage British forces in a, in a battle. And by and large, they lose those battles. They are, are, except in the case of Bennington, Lexington and Concord, you know, in a couple of specific areas, uh, they're usually no match for professional British soldiers, right? That their real contribution to the grand strategy of the revolution is in this real and concrete and sort of bloody way uh, through their, their efforts, they are the ones who really win the hearts and minds of this neutral population, right? They help explain how we go from a mostly neutral and loyalist population in 1776 to a mostly 
committed patriot population in 1781. Now, in order to look at this closer, I'm not going to go over each and every aspect of the military contest uh, during the American Revolution, okay? You, you have your textbook, and I hope you've read it. It's a great, the history is vast and wide. It, it's greater than any one lecture. In, in many ways, it's greater than any one course. I'm going to look at a few general battles and strategic moments during the Revolution to sort of highlight exactly how the Patriot Militia acted as this, this tool of political education and conversion among a sometimes unwilling or disinterested colonial population. And again, the big strategic question is this. In 1776, the vast majority, the vast majority of colonists are not patriots, right? Third of them are committed loyalists, and the others are, they're neutrals. They're people who are disinterested. They're people who are only interested in their own security. What they want is security and certainty. They want to pursue happiness, right? Pursuing happiness mostly meaning pursuing their economic goals, growing the wealth of their families, the things they had been doing all through the 18th century, right? But by 1783, we're building this country in which, I mean, almost everybody who's left is now a patriot, and many of them a committed patriot, many of them who had served in some military capacity as a patriot militia guerrilla or at, in the Continental Army itself in this war of revolution. And we have to ask why that happened why the Americans were able to win them over, and why the British failed to. You know, they had an equal shot. They start the war, the British and the, and the American rebels, each with an equal amount of people committed to their side. Right? So why did the British fail to win the middle? And to look at this, to really understand it, we're going to look a little more closely at the actual British strategies, because they help us highlight the American strategies and how this works. And, you know, the British will make a number of strategic miscalculations uh, up to almost nearly the end of the revolution. They will begin to finally get a sense of what's really at stake, but it'll be a, a case of too little too late, as we'll see. So initially, when the troubles start in the colonies, the British saw the problem mostly as one of law enforcement. You know, between 1765, the Stamp Act riots and protests, all the way up to 1775, Lexington and Concord and the Siege of Boston, the British didn't realize that they were facing a colonial rebellion, right? A social revolution. Mostly, they said, well, it's a matter of law enforcement. In a couple of sea northern sea uh, side cities, there are entrenched groups of radicals and troublemakers. And they felt that if we address the legitimate grievances while punishing and targeting you know, a few of the select troublemakers, you know, through the legal process, will pretty much uh, nip this whole thing before it starts to grow. They'll cut it off. And what they found out was that with each successive effort to do that, to, to step up the sort of police enforcement in the colonies, they actually further radicalized the populations, right? They didn't read the situation well at the very beginning. You know, after the intolerable acts or the, um, you know, of 1774, or the coercive acts, right? They, they, when they, you know, they demand repayment for tea, they, they, they um, blockade the port of Boston, you know, all of that happens. They actually create both um, hostility and alarm in the rural parts of New England, who had been sort of lukewarm to this, to this revolutionary cause up until that point, and they actually cause real economic hardship there as well. And they find what actually happens is they actually drive uh, the rural, citizens of New England specifically closer to the radical leadership in Boston. They actually help create that community, that resistance, which explodes in their face quite literally at Lexington and Concord uh, and, and, you know, the Siege of Boston. And after that, you know, after the Battles of Bunker Hill, 1775, by the summer of 1775, the British realized that, hey, we have a full-scale war on our hands, right? and they begin their second strategy. So they start with this, this strategy that maybe could best be called a police action, right? It's one of law enforcement and targeted punishment to recognizing or suggesting this is a war of maneuver. And it's, this is actually, they come to this conclusion actually somewhat in a response to the creation of the Continental Army, right? That these, these 
uh, sort of rabble militiamen have now been organized into uh, a supposed professional force that has a face, that has uh, uh, identifiable leadership. Well, the British response to that was the way they would have responded to any military contest over the last hundred years when they fought other nation states, a war of maneuver. We'll address this head on with a sort of large grand strategy war of maneuver. And in order to pursue this, they put two brothers in charge, two commanders, uh, the, the brothers Howe, H-O-W-E, right? Richard Howe is the commander of the naval forces, and he will almost instantly establish a blockade of the coast uh, of all of the colonies. <clears throat> and it's actually one of the most effective things the British do. Uh, running this blockade and breaking this blockade is, is one of the great challenges all throughout the revolution for the rebel forces. And, you know, getting supplies and supports from outside of the colonies is of critical importance. You know, actually, and it also creates a long supply line along the whole coast of uh, the American colonies, that as long as the British are near the coast anywhere, they can resupply, re-outfit very, very easily. In fact, they, they will do a great job early on uh, uh, of conquering most of the seaside and, and, and seaborne cities and controlling them. William Howe is in charge of the land forces. And William Howe makes a decision right out. The first thing he does is he abandons Boston. And they, and they never come back. You know, New England had been the seat of the revolution, the kind of heart of radicalism prior to 1776. They give up on it. They figure, we'll get back there. But it's too radicalized. The population is, 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 is too patriot-leaning. They abandon Boston and they move down. They set up operations in New York. New York City is the new plan. And there's a couple of reasons for this. One, New York is centralized, right? It, it's more centralized. If you're going to fight this grand war of maneuver, you want a more centralized city. New York, New Jersey, Eastern Pennsylvania, Delaware had a much larger base of loyalist supporters. At least they believed that they did. And early on, it appeared that that belief was correct. Also, it put them in a better position to get another very important city, Philadelphia, right? Philadelphia being the other large seaside city or riverside access to the ocean, right? City, it was our largest city. It was the capital of the Continental Congress and the rebellion, you know, so that was all in the initial uh, strategic war of maneuver plan. And in 1776, you know, begins in, from the summer of 1776 begins uh, a long series of battles. Basically, there's an amphibious invasion off of Long Island of the British. Uh, Commander William Howe leads the British forces. Washington meets him and begins a series of defeats and retreats. Basically, the British, over the next several months, going into the winter, drive the Patriots clear out of New Jersey, right, out of northern Delaware, out of southern New York, and, <clears throat> you know, we're closing in on Christmas, basically, with the uh, British forces in complete control of uh, the most populated areas of the Mid-Atlantic and the Patriot forces having been driven clear out. And not just the Continental Army, but the Patriot militias and, and the more ardent Patriot-leaning uh, citizens fled in the advance, uh, you know, evacuated where they lived in the, in the advance of these British troops. Now, although they came to control for a period of time politically and tactically these areas and it was a tactical success and there were loyalists and a lot of them there to support the British cause ultimately both in the successes they have in 1776 and again in the summer of 1777 they'll expand into into Pennsylvania and into Delaware and the Chesapeake they'll have these tactical advantages and brief political advantages but they end up being strategic failures for a number of reasons one, one is they fail to actually truly defeat, eliminate, and eradicate the Continental Army. You know, Washington knows from the very beginning, he goes, hey, I don't actually have to win battles. I just can't lose. I just can't completely lose. I can't have the face, the international face, the national face of this revolution wiped out. And he also knows he just needs time. He needs time for better training, trying for recruitment, trying to prepare his soldiers to be better at facing professional British soldiers. And as long as he can keep the core of that army alive, keep support alive in the colonies, time and resilience will be his ultimate friend. Really, time is the enemy of the British. Because of political realities at home, because they want, they have this belief that they can score a quick victory through battles, 
If that doesn't happen, taxpayers at home will be less and less interested over the course of a long war of attrition to keep throwing good money after bad. And so that's one of the problems right there is that they don't actually truly defeat. They drive off the continental forces. And I should also say as a matter of just good tactical generalship, you know, and other generals have said this, keeping your army together during a, a, a chaotic, what might otherwise be a chaotic defeat is one of the great successes of discipline and leadership. And it's one thing that these new colonial military leaders do really, really well. Their guys run, but they don't break and run. It's not a panicked run. They keep it together. They hole up in Pennsylvania. They survive to fight another day. The bigger problem, though, for the British happened like this. So when the British come through and the, Br and the British troops occupy uh, northern Jersey, as a specific example, and these other places, they put these loyalists in charge of, of the local government. And, you know, they were under the belief, people were under the belief that, wow, maybe the patriots are going to de get defeated quickly. And a number of people, they also, the British put forth this thing that if you swore an oath of loyalty, right, to the British crown, no matter what your leanings were before, you would get a pardon. And, you know, in New Jersey, some 3,000 people stepped forward to swear this oath, including one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, uh, Richard Stockton, although I should say he did so under duress. He had been imprisoned for a while first, but he does actually sign one of these oaths of loyalty, and they named a college after him. Um, you know, there was this belief that, so they put them in charge, but there's a problem. The problem is how the civilians are treated under this occupation. What happens often in occupations throughout all of history, modern times and past times, is the occupying army is often brutal and boorish towards the civilian population. You know, the British soldiers had a tendency to see anyone, oath of loyalty or not, as a potential rebel. They abused, they arrested, they beat up, they killed many civilians. And they had this other thing called foraging. And foraging is something that comes up again and again and again. And what foraging is this. As the British soldiers move further and further away from the coast, well, basically, they relied on stealing from the civilian population for all their needs. They would quarter themselves in their houses, basically turn the residents there into servants. They would take their food, take their clothing, take whatever they wanted, sometimes to the point of starving out the people who lived there. And What's worse is these loyalists had been put in charge were often, uh, you know, conniving. They would use this, th th this occupation to seize other people's lands, to join in this abuse of, of other colonial citizens, and not just patriot-leaning people, but these neutrals, these people in the middle. You know, the, the problem becomes, basically, there's no security for people during the British, during the British occupation. The British occupation creates hardship and harassment of the neutral civilian population. And this is a real problem. Everywhere the British army goes, they actually create more patriots or more people who are sympathetic to the patriot cause than had been there before they arrived. As a matter of fact, many of the civilians there, even people who had sworn an oath of allegiance to the crown during this initial occupation, you know, began to see the Patriot militia and the Patriot armies as liberators, hoping for their return. Late in 1776, uh, the Continental Army <coughs> scores two victories that really aren't all that tactically impressive, but they were of great strategic importance. And they are the Battles of Trenton on Christmas Eve and the uh, Battles of Princeton. And basically these are attacks on outpost garrisons of Hessians and British soldiers you know, during the occupation of the Mid-Atlantic. And because of these victories, you know, like I said, these aren't, they don't gain back complete and total control of the Mid-Atlantic from these. But what does happen is two things. One, people take notice. It lifts the morale, uh, which had been kind of low due to the series of defeats of the colonists in general across all the colonies. It brings, the, uh, it brings to notice the quality and the potential success of the American Revolution to the eyes of foreign powers, particularly the French. This is really we begin to, to, to actively pursue this French alliance. And it actually makes the British do something. 
the British become nervous about defending all these external posts of British soldiers. And so what they do is they pull them all back to one concentrated area along the coast of north central New Jersey in uh, the area of Perth Amboy and New Brunswick, if you know where that is. So up on the Hudson and, and along the northern coast of New Jersey in the north central area. And what happens is whenever the British soldiers leave an area, I mean, as soon as they left an area, the Patriot militias come back. And when they came back, the very first thing they do is they put the screws to all the loyalists and anyone who swore an oath. Your life was in jeopardy had you sworn an oath to the loyalists. And northern New Jersey in particular uh, erupts in this really violent uh, colonist on colonist uh, uh, war, basically, this community versus community civil war. And it becomes chaotic. But most of the neutrals there and many of the people who had been soft patriots before they go over to the Patriot side. You know, because of this experience under British occupation and the harassment and the violence and the insecurity they had experienced, they join up with the Patriots. And another experience that comes out of this, because this will happen again and again, this exact pattern. British soldiers will roll through, drive out the Patriot militias and drive back the Continental Army. They'll put loyalists in charge. During this occupation, the loyalist lackeys and the British troops will together harass and use violence and intimidation and stealing and foraging against the civilian population, radicalizing an otherwise disinterested and neutral population, making them more patriot leaning. What's more, the British army always moves away. They always have to pursue the rebels somewhere else. For War of maneuver reasons, they can't stay. There isn't enough of them to occupy all the places. They're not really there to act as an occupational force. They're there to act as a combative force. And so the British Army, one of the things that was certain was the British Army would always move, would always leave. And the other thing that was certain, and this is the dead certainty that every colonist ultimately had to reckon with, the Patriot militias would come back. They always came back because the British Army failed to ever truly eliminate them. They failed to ever truly eliminate the Continentals. And so the guys in the middle, two things that would operate on this level. One, <clears throat> they've been radicalized, made more patriot leaning due to the behavior and the, the sort of boorish intrusion of occupation by the British troops and their loyalist lackeys. And two, the Patriots would come back. They began to realize that, that's the pattern. And the Patriots didn't just want an oath of allegiance. That wasn't good enough for them, not in this face-to-face, -face, dark community-on-community -community civil war. Oh, no. They expected your true commitment to show you were committed, especially if you were someone who had sworn a, an oath of allegiance to the loyalist side and you needed to save your skin. You had to sign up. You had to join with the militia, take part in these violent acts, share in that experience, putting your life on the line and taking someone else's life off the line for this cause or you could volunteer for the Continental Army and do it at an even more legitimate national level, both of which happened. But that is really how the Patriot militias got the neutrals to come over to their side. You know, it was an experience of war that made this happen and a sort of purposeful violence of the Patriot militia, the actual uh, miscalculations of the war of maneuver strategy of the British that kind of created this, you know, because at its heart, the neutrals or the citizens, any of the citizens really, except for those who were really ideologically committed to one side or the other, they wanted security. You want security. And security is based on certainties. There is no security without certainties, without guarantees. And what they began to realize was the loyalists and the British military couldn't guarantee anything, could create no certainties. As a matter of fact, their presence was almost certain to jeopardize your security through this foraging, through these abusive behaviors. And furthermore, the other thing that was certain was they're going to leave. They're not going to stick around to keep the Patriots away anyway. What was certain is that the Patriots were going to come back. And if you wanted to save your skin, if you wanted to have any semblance of security for yourself, for your family, for your future, you had to align with the Patriot cause. And it took more than an oath of allegiance, right? It certainly took an oath of allegiance. It took active commitment. It took an active commitment. 
And this will happen again. You know, how in the following year will do the same thing. He will conquer this whole area, the Chesapeake, Delaware. He'll conquer Philadelphia, drive out the Continental Congress, send them fleeing, send them fleeing. And yet, every place that he rolled through, every place the British soldiers had been and stationed for a period of time, ends up being more patriotic, radicalized, being more radicalized than before he got there for the exact same reason. This pattern repeated itself over and over and over again. And late in 1777, there's a, uh, you know, the British suffer a major defeat in Saratoga, which is the great victory of the Continental Army during this war. The forces of General John Burgoyne are ultimately defeated in Saratoga. Uh, uh, 8,500 professional British soldiers are either killed or surrender to American forces. In spite of winning most of the battles, 1777 ends with William Howe abandoning the Mid-Atlantic, basically holding up only in New York City and Rhode Island, the British losing complete control of the North, the Mid-Atlantic states, the Chesapeake, and all of New England by 1778 are firmly and permanently under the control of the patriotic rebels. I'm going to end part one of this lecture right here. The next lecture we're going to show how this happens again and functions in the southern theater of the war. And I'm going to put forth just a few ideas about looking at the American history from this perspective and looking at history in general from any perspective and what it all means and what it might mean to you.